Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Chronic Disease and Injury section webinar. Today's uh, presentation is on Early Detection Saves Lives, Communities Connecting to Fight Lung Cancer. So just some housekeeping review items. Uh, we will be addressing questions at the end of the broad or at the end of the presentation. We have several presenters today, so we'll be waiting till the end to do that. Uh, but in the meantime, as we are talking through everything, uh, please enter any questions that you have in the questions box on the right hand side of the panel there. Um, we also, um, I've downloaded the presentation slides for today, um, so you can access that on the right hand side as well, where you see handouts and you can uh, click into that and download that file during the broadcast. And so I just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. Um, and just as a review for the chronic disease and injury section, our goal is to help all North Carolinians develop healthy and safe communities and health systems to prevent and control chronic disease, injury and violence, and to eliminate health inequities. So as I mentioned, we have several presenters today. Um, first up, we have Caitlin Kapler. She is the North Carolina Comprehensive Cancer Control Program Coordinator here at the Division of Public Health in the Chronic Disease and Injury section, but she also works in the Cancer Prevention and Control Branch. And then we have Jenny Denai, and she's the Director of Programs at the Lung Cancer Initiative of North Carolina. And then we also have Dr. Katherine Milam, She's the medical oncologist at um, Levine Cancer Institute. And then we have a lung cancer survivor on with us, um, Tama Hargraves, um, with the Lung Cancer Initiative of North Carolina as well. So first up, I'm going to toss it to you, Caitlin, um, to talk about your program. Great. Thank you. Um, once again, I'm Caitlin Kapler. I'm a program coordinator with the Cancer Prevention and Control Branch uh, here at the Division of Public Health. Um, to tell you a little bit more about uh, the Cancer Prevention and Control Branch, which is also known as the Cancer Branch, we are housed under the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. We're part of the NC Division of Public Health's Chronic Disease and Injury Section. So as you can see on the slide, there are three key programs in the cancer branch, the Comprehensive Cancer Control Program, the Breast and Cervical Cancer Control Program, and the Wise Woman Project. Um, the cancer branch through the North Carolina State Comprehensive Control Plan, also known as the North Carolina Cancer Plan, works to ensure a comprehensive and collaborative approach to address the state's cancer burden. The North Carolina Cancer Plan focuses on six priority cancers, one of which is lung cancer, that cause the most burden in the community. Um, these programs use methods that have worked in similar, similar states to prevent and control these cancers by providing outreach, education, and screening services. Next slide. Um, as seen here, the North Carolina Comprehensive Cancer Control Pro Program takes an integrated approach to address the burden of cancer. This process includes, but is not limited to, developing and nurturing partnerships and building partnership networks, like our partnership with the Lung Cancer In Initiative of North Carolina. Um, we also do coordinating and fostering education and training opportunities, facilitating resource sharing, community and clinical linkages among the partner networks, as well as engaging communities in the process in order to reduce the burden of cancer. So what services are provided as part of our process? Um, the NC Comprehensive Cancer Control Program's goal is to equip others with the knowledge, skills, and tools to promote health through the cancer continuum to reduce the cancer burden in North Carolina. We coordinate and foster opportunities that increase support for prevention, early detection, care and treatment, survivorship of cancer, and health equity in areas such as data, evaluation, surveillance and visualization, community engagement and partnerships, communication and public awareness, outreach, education and training, connection to resources that increase support for programs and services, as well as consultation and technical assistance. Uh, for more information about the Cancer Control Program, you can visit the North Carolina Division of Public Health website. Um, now I'd like to turn the presentation over to the Lung Cancer Initiative of North Carolina. Uh, first, we have Ginny 
uh, Danae, who is the Director of Programs for the Lung Cancer Initiative, uh, followed by Tama Hargraves, who's an advocate for their organization, as well as a lung cancer survivor, and then Dr. Katherine Melham, uh, who's a medical oncologist with the Levine Cancer Institute. So thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing what your presentation will talk about. Hi, thank you. Again, this is Jenny Denai with the Lung Cancer Initiative. I am the Director of Programs here, and I just want to go over a little bit about our organization and um, what we do here for Lung Cancer in North Carolina. Okay. Um, so our mission is to save lives and provide support to those affected by lung cancer. And we we do that through our four program areas, which are research and we recently are at the end of our three-year strategic vision, which is to reach and impact patients in every county in North Carolina. And we're doing pretty good. I think we're about 90 in 92 counties of 100. So we're pretty excited about that. We are a 501c3. We're a nonprofit. Um, we're really the main organization here in North Carolina focused on lung cancer research and education. Um, and I like to think that we really specialize in connecting patients and families with researchers and the medical community, even like today having Dr. Milam on the call. We work a lot with her and other um, um, people in the medical community. Here's a picture of our staff. We recently did add two, two new staff members, Colleen Christensen, who's the engagement coordinator, who works a lot with me on programs. And then Lane Moore, um, the communications and development specialist, and he does a lot of our marketing. Our board of directors, I, I feel like we're unique because we do have um, survivors on our board. We have uh, medical providers, advocates, people who have lost loved ones, all representative on our board. Our scientific, scientific advisory committee, this group really leads our research efforts. And Dr. Milam, who will speak in a minute, she's on our scientific advisory committee as um, along with representation from all the five medical, major medical institutions in North Carolina. And we do fund at all of those institutions as well. And we also do have um, a survivor, we have an advocate, um, we have other repre representation as well. And since 2008, we funded almost $2 million in lung cancer research, and most of that is here in North Carolina. So here's just some of the faces of lung cancer. Um, most of us know that it can affect anyone. If you have lungs, you can get lung cancer. And so here's our four program areas that I mentioned. Research, um, we fund at the five major medical institutions in North Carolina. Right now, we have um, eight researchers that we're funding across the state, and we're really proud that our research dollars do stay here in North Carolina. Awareness, we do this really through all of our events we have across the state. We do 5Ks, galas, um, golf tournaments, and so we reach a lot of individuals that way. And then we also do health fairs, um, presentations to businesses, things like that across the state as well. And the awareness, I like to think of it as our um, sort of awareness to the general public, you know, getting out there to the audiences that really don't know anything about lung cancer. And then education, we, um, we educate providers. So we educate medical oncologists, we educate primary care. There's a lot happening in the field of lung cancer right now. So it's a lot to keep up with for providers. Um, and especially with lung cancer screening being newer, there's a lot of education to be done with the primary care education group. And so we, we do things throughout the year to educate providers. We also have events throughout the year for um, like our Power Up series who educates uh, patients, family members, caregivers, also the general public. And we do that um, throughout the state, we partner with organizations like Levine Cancer Institute in Charlotte, and we have experts come out and speak to the different groups, and each location has different, um, different topics as well, so, and we record them and have them online, and so you can view them even if you can't travel across the state. 
access, we have our Access to Care Gas Card program, which actually you'll hear from Tama Hargraves in a minute, but when she was on our board, she actually started the gas card program it was her idea and it has been been out over 2,000 gas cards because some patients receive more than one and they're $50 gas cards we also have access grants which are more like community grants that we can give to organizations or community hospitals um, some of those I think there's some examples here's the ones that we did last year in 2000, um, 2018 we did a retreat for lung cancer survivors um, we did some about screening. Um, there's kind of been all different, you know, we just encourage organizations to bring their ideas to us and kind of see if it fits the access to care mold, but anything from clinical trials, screening, survivorship, things like that. And really our goal is just more survivors. And you can see, you know, we've been an organization now for more, over 10 years and we can see the number of survivors each year grow, and it's just really um, inspiring to see. And there's hope. Like I mentioned, it's an exciting time for lung cancer research and clinical trials. There's so much, so many new treatment options. I know Dr. Milo might touch on that as well, but it's just, it's a very exciting time. And we need you. We need volunteers. We need um, not even just sponsorships, but volunteers to do health fairs, to distribute our educational materials, um, to join an event. There's lots of ways to get involved. And just to mention again that November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. You can check our website to see the different things we have going on and ways that you can get plugged in. Together, there's always something we can do. So now um, here's Tama Hargraves, who is a lung cancer survivor and I will let her tell you about her story. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm actually not a product of early detection, but I am a product of a very proactive primary care physician, which is important. Um, as of last Saturday, I am a 13-year lung cancer survivor. I was diagnosed stage 3B. I had no symptoms except a little bump in my neck, which turned out to be um, uh, a lymph node that was impacted by blood, uh, lung cancer. I shopped for my treatment, um, encouraged um, several people, including my son, who's an uh, emergency medicine doctor in Atlanta, to get to the close by. I did choose um, UNC. Um, because it, uh, they offered me a clinical trial. You can see from my pictures, um, I had, have had a variety of experiences through my treatment. The treatment that I had was a clinical trial that involved um, heavy dose chemo, higher dose radiation, and a targeted therapy called Terceva. Now, 13 years ago, they weren't even testing for mutations when I was diagnosed. I ended up having this treatment nine months later um, was, what was there was essentially gone based on what my doctor told me. Uh, three years later, I went out of remission, but by then I'd learned about mutations, so I asked my um, oncologist to test, have my tissue tested, and sure enough, I found out I had the EGFR mutation, which the Terceva did impact. Not sure which of those three things I had um, over the years actually took away the lung cancer, but um, whatever it was at work. It was not globally, it was not a successful clinical trial, but there were subgroups of people who it was effective for. Um, three years after I went out of remission, I did have um, some more chemo, but I also had one met to the brain. So um, they did CyberKnife, uh, was doing fine for two years, and then something showed up again in the brain. Um, as it turned out, and you can see by the one picture, I ended up having a craniotomy to find out what it was. And it was scar tissue from the treatment. Since that time, I've been doing well. I retired from my position as a speech language pathologist at Wake County Public Schools. And I became a patiently navigator volunteer at UNC's Cancer Hospital. So every week I um, go in and um, actually work with the oncologist that I'm still being treated by and his staff. And I work closely with other lung cancer patients. Um, it's been a very rewarding um, 
experience for me and I hope it is as rewarding for them. I'm still very involved with the Lung Cancer Initiative. Um, I, I was at their very first 5K, I don't know how many years ago, it's probably I think you guys have faded out. And um, being a survivor to now an advocate and pretty much an activist too, with my story due to involved in things like this as well, if you're interested. Thanks for, your, for listening. Okay, now we will um, pass it on to Dr. Milo. All right, well, thank you so much for including me in this opportunity to speak today. And um, Jenny, I continue to be really, uh, you know, so impressed with what the Lung Can Cancer Initiative of North Carolina does for our state. I know that there are many, you know, attempts nationally um, to increase awareness of lung cancer. Um, however, I think it's really so important um, what we are doing in our backyard and the Lung Cancer Initiative of North Carolina really keeps, as Jenny mentioned, um, you know, access, education, research at home in a very collaborative nature uh, among all of our, you know, institutions, our communities, um, our friends, our family. So um, I am certainly grateful for what uh, Lung Cancer Initiative of North Carolina has done. And Tama, thank you for sharing. Congratulations on your 13 years. Um, we are we are so proud to be witness uh, to you sharing, um, you know, your your personal journey. Um, so uh, again, I just I can't thank you enough for for being a part of that uh, team. It's really hard, I, you know. I'm, it is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. We follow Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Our color is white. Um, we can't dye our fountains white. It doesn't show up as well as pink. Um, and so we, you know, and I think that there's some misperceptions about lung cancer, which is uh, some of what I will focus on today. And just making sure that um, I think it's so much of understanding how to create early detection and how we can save lives is by understanding lung cancer, uh, understanding um, what's happening and how we can change that. So to give you some perspective, um, cancer in general is a leading cause of death in the United States. Um, we talk about uh, heart disease um, as a priority. However, cancer is equivalent in the number of deaths that it could causes um, in our nation. And what's very impressive is how much of that is related to lung cancer. Uh, you can see here on this pie chart, uh, other cancers, other tumor types and their representation. Uh, however, lung cancer causes more cancer-related deaths than breast, prostate, colon, rectal, and pancreas combined. Um, it's a, a very um, impressive number. And you can see here on this slide with these statistics nationally, the American Cancer Society predicts 228,150 new cases with 142,670 deaths. So it's really impactful, uh, not only the number of diagnoses each year, but the number of deaths. That's no different in the state of North Carolina. Um, really, our numbers uh, in our state match those that are seen natural, uh, nationally. Um, and again, lung cancer causing over 5,000 um, deaths in the state of North Carolina every year. It's interesting. I had I had heard a statistic at one point, you know, and it's impacted me tr tremendously. The number of people that die from lung cancer every day is equivalent to the number of people 
that uh, are passengers on a jumbo jet. If we had a jumbo airline fall out of the sky every single day, you know that we would be hearing about it and that we would be making a difference. And yet that's exactly what's happening with lung cancer. And yet so often we are unaware of these statistics. So I mentioned that there are many people that are diagnosed with lung cancer and many people that die with lung cancer. In breast and prostate cancer, we are fortunate enough that most Patients diagnosed with these cancers uh, can live five years or more uh, despite having a cancer diagnosis. However, with lung cancer, the five-year survival rates are still significantly less than those of other uh, common cancers. And what's devastating is that despite these statistics, there is very little federal funding that is placed into, uh, whether it's research or advocacy, uh, for this specific malignancy. There's a huge discrepancy uh, within that. So why is that? Well, I mean, there's been, there are a lot, there's a lot of stigma that surrounds lung cancer, and this is still today. Um, Still, you know, over 80%, close to 90% of lung cancers are um, related to tobacco. However, that number is changing. And as Jenny mentioned earlier, lung cancer can affect anyone. The only thing you need to have are lungs. And, um, and it doesn't require that you have a tobacco history to be diagnosed with lung cancer. Certainly it's still the majority, but you can see in this pie chart here that 15% of cases of lung cancer are in those who have never smoked cigarettes. So much so that non-smoking lung cancer is the sixth leading cause of cancer-related death. So not, lung cancer is the number one cause, but never smoking lung cancer is still in the top 10. So although most of the time we still associate lung cancer with a tobacco history, uh, prolonged exposure to secondhand smoke still has impact. Previous radiation therapy to the chest that causes chronic scarring and inflammation to the chest. Somebody may have received radiation for a different type of cancer, possibly a lymphoma or a breast cancer. That can increase risk over time. Occupational exposures, uh, certainly there are fine dust particles that get inhaled and cause chronic damage over time. Radon gas is another a uh, risk factor to increase the risk of lung cancer, and then anything else that really can cause chronic damage to the lungs, a uh, scarring, inflammation. Certainly, if you've had a previous diagnosis of lung cancer, you would be more at risk for having another one. With a family history of lung cancer, we have not identified uh, many uh, genes or, or inheritable genes. Uh, that can be passed down in families. Uh, we see this more common in breast or prostate and even uh, colon and kidney cancers. There is not a gene that increases risk for lung cancer um, that passes down in the family, but we certainly do see some trends. I mentioned radon as a potential for a non-tobacco cause of lung cancer. This is actually the second leading cause of lung cancer. When you consider that tobacco causes 90%, you know, the percentage of lung cancer diagnoses related to radon is still very low. Um, but it is important uh, to be aware uh, of radon exposure. This is a map that gives you an idea of you know, where is radon? Well, it's, you know, it's really a geologic issue. It's uh, things in the ground. And so where there's a lot of mining, a lot of 
uh, granite mountains, uh, that's where we see those higher uh, potential for radon exposure. That doesn't mean that um, that everybody is clustered and getting lung cancer in these areas, but it's interesting to think about that um, in some of these high areas that uh, what they kind of measure as, as high for radon exposure is actually gonna be somewhere on the order of equivalent of a half a pack of cigarettes um, a day. So if you wanna make a cigarette comparison, um, you know, that's, that's what you're getting in the pink uh, focal areas. Most of North Carolina is very low risk of radon until we get into the mountains with some slight areas of uh, moderate and variable um, exposure. What's challenging about most cancers, and uh, Tama mentioned, you know, the diligence of her primary care physician in recognizing a lump as a lymph node uh, being abnormal. A lot of times, uh, there's a delay in, in diagnosis because somebody may have persistent cough, um, recurrent, uh, you know, presumed infections, and may have uh, failed antibiotics uh, on multiple occasions, leading to a chest X-ray that may or may not identify a tumor, um, and ultimately leading to a CT scan. Some people will develop hoarseness because lymph nodes are pressing on the voice box. Uh, or chest or shoulder pain uh, due to some inflammation or irritation on the lining of the lung. Sometimes it can be even less specific, where you just have unexplained weight loss, um, significant uh, weight loss in a short period of time in combination uh, with some of these other symptoms. One of the things I tell all patients, uh, you know, whether uh, they are uh, diagnosed with an early or, or late stage lung cancer, it doesn't matter. Quitting smoking at any time is beneficial. We actually have data to support this. It's not just us telling you, hey, we think you should quit smoking. Um, quite honestly, we know that it uh, quitting smoking will allow for a better response to treatment, a more durable response to treatment and a better tolerability of treatment. It also puts less stress on the heart and the lungs. And so from a cardiac a heart perspective, um, you're also uh, benefiting the body, which helps uh, allow you to tolerate your treatment better. There are a lot of different programs uh, that are now successful in smoking cessation. We recognizing that smoking is, um, you know, actually very addictive and very difficult to overcome. Um, so it's really important to get engaged with a comprehensive plan and dedicate to that. What we're trying to focus on is how can we make a change? How do we, how do we take that five-year overall survival um, to higher numbers? Well, a lot of that has to do with uh, detecting cancer earlier so that we can have a curative approach and shift those numbers uh, from numbers of cancer deaths to closer to what we're seeing with breast cancer and prostate cancer. This led to the not multiple attempts in determining how we can um, detect lung cancer earlier, uh, there have been trials that have looked at using a chest X-ray to see if we can identify a lung cancer earlier. Those have been unsuccessful. This was the first successful trial, the National Lung Screening Trial. This was conducted in the United States. is the largest one ever completed with over 50,000 people enrolled. They compared an, a chest X-ray being done once a year with a what we call a low dose CT scan of the chest, low dose meaning very minimal radiation exposure, um, and but very good picture. So it's not a low quality, it's just very minimal radiation. Um, and specifically targeted what we would think to be a higher risk group of people um, over the age of 55, been smoking uh, what we call pack year history. And so this would be somebody who smoked a pack of cigarettes a day for 30 years or two packs of cigarettes a day for 15 years. 
And um, or even if they have quit, uh, they've quit recently, which we would consider to be within the past 15 years. These were very impressive results. It demonstrated that a low dose CT screen, low dose CT scan of the chest can detect um, cancer and improve survival. 40% of the cancers detected in this screening group were very early stage, stage 1A, which is um, a small nodule that can be surgically removed and does not require chemotherapy or radiation, and that would be with curative intent. And so making a tremendous impact on detecting early stage lung cancer to cure lung cancer and improve survival. There was a 20% reduction in lung cancer death and even all cause of mortality. This is not the only trial that's been done. They also did a European version, the Dutch-Belgian randomized lung cancer screening trial. This was uh, called the Nelson trial. It basically had a similar population as the um, lung cancer screening trial done in the United States. And what was most impressive was the impact on the reduction in the risk of death from lung cancer in women. This was 61% at 10 years. And that was considerably higher than that which was um, reduced with men. So very, very impressive. Um, now lung cancer, um, lung cancer screening is a recommendation, is very important um, for anyone who is considered to be within these guidelines, ages 55 to 74 years of age, uh, you know, greater than or equal to a 30-pack year history, a current or former smoker within 15 years, and uh, would meet qualifications. There is um, CMS with uh, Medicare supports this, insurance supports this. There are centers, radiology centers that do these low dose CT screenings. And uh, it should be initiated through a, a lung doctor, a pulmonologist or a primary care physician uh, after a discussion uh, with whomever it is that feels like they meet these criteria. If that initial scan is negative, that does not mean that that is your only scan. You continue these scans once a year until no longer meeting age criteria. So we want to maintain these um, scans done once a year, just like people get their mammogram done once a year. If you're high risk for lung cancer, you should be getting um, a CT scan of your chest. This is where we're gonna make an impact. This is where we are going to save lives by having early detection and early intervention. We're doing more than just early intervention. We're making an impact once people are diagnosed with lung cancer. And even though I've shown you that there's low funding for lung cancer research, we have made a tremendous progress in our advancements and honestly have surpassed many other types of cancer in our thinking process, our research, and, um, and finding effective therapies. In the 70s, we really didn't do much for lung cancer once it was diagnosed. There weren't effective um, treatments. It was really in the 80s that we started providing chemotherapy. Even early in um, my training, uh, when somebody with lung cancer was diagnosed with brain metastases, we often did not pursue any treatment. And TAMA has been a testament to the advancements we've made from a neurosurgical perspective and radiation perspective and other treatments that we do not stop with brain mats. That is just something we manage these days and try and continue to move forward. And I'm so glad that she can provide her testimony to those advancements. These days we are um, using targeted therapies uh, for mutations within the tumor, like TAMA EGFR mutation, but we know that there are many more, and we have designed uh, therapies directed against that mutation. Some of these are oral, and we have immunotherapy as well. I've listed that 
here and you know how we think about treating lung cancer, if it's something like a stage 1A lung cancer, we're going to try and cut that out and throw it in the trash. Um, if we can't do surgery safely, our radiation techniques have evolved so we can do a specialized radiation um, that is nearly equivalent to actually going to the operating room and having it physically removed. For more advanced disease, we have um, brought, we've continued to utilize chemotherapy. Uh, I've mentioned the targeted therapy, which includes uh, pills, as well as immunotherapy, which is certainly a buzz and a huge advancement that we've made in many cancers, not just lung cancer. I think our advancements have been in supporting um, patients and families. Uh, we've done a better job of managing nausea, of managing fatigue, of working on exercise, of using acupuncture and massage. So, you know, it's not just the treatments that are specific to the lung cancer. It is the broader understanding of how somebody's life is changing and how we can make an impact so that they can maintain their physical, mental uh, health. Uh, which allows us to provide more options for treatment when something may not work or we need to use other local solutions uh, for an impending problem. We can drain fluid. We can um, use specialized radiation. Um, we can stent airways, oftentimes like we um, stent vessels in the heart. All this treatment is dependent on the stage, the type of lung cancer, and uh, whether or not there are any markers that would drive these decisions. Um, you know, there are some that uh, have drugs approved. There are others that we've got drugs that are going to be approved, and the research is evolving. The immunotherapy options uh, are abundant and sometimes used by themselves and sometimes used in combination with chemotherapy. It's a completely different way to approach cancer treatment than chemotherapy. Rather than killing uh, the cells, we are trying to have the body recognize the cancer as foreign and fight it off with its own immune system. So it's a really different approach. And in some situations, um, it's not the best treatment option. In other situations, it's best in combination with other treatments or by itself. So, you know, my message today is that really we do have um, we have something that we can always do. And I and I am so proud to have been a part of this evolution and and advancements that we've made in lung cancer thus far, recognizing that there is so much more to do. We will not be complacent, um, but we have to be proud of the successes that, that we are achieving and just remaining curious. Um, there is more for us to do and there's more for everyone um, to do. And, and I think it's not just from a physician or advocate perspective. I think Jenny made a good point. It's just about volunteering. It's about spreading the word. When you see a lung when you see that lung cancer causes so many can so many deaths each year, it's very hard for us to build our advocacy group because there are not as many survivors as there are for other tumor types. And so we have to be the voices for those who cannot be that for themselves. And so I encourage, you know, all of you um, to really think about how you can uh, be a neighbor, be a friend, um, you know, encourage somebody to quit smoking, find an effective program, uh, find a, if you meet criteria for lung cancer screening CT, to talk with your primary care physician. And if you do get diagnosed with lung cancer, to recognize that there are great organizations within the state and great cancer care uh, to really guide um, anyone through that process. And I want to thank so much for the organizers of this meeting for us to be able to share this information today. Thank you so much, Dr. Milam and Jenny and Tama as well for the work that you do um, to reduce the burden of lung cancer in our state. Um, we are proud to be your partners. Um, I would like to open up the floor now for questions. So if anyone would like to submit a question, go ahead and do that now.
We are encouraging questions. Wow, it's a quiet group this afternoon. We'll give you another minute or so and then we will sign off. Okay, we had uh, one coming up now. Um, so I guess I would direct this towards um, Jenny and the Lung Cancer Initiative. Um, how are you reaching out to rural communities in the state? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So one of the main ways we do that is through our gas card program because we know a lot of the patients live in the rural areas and are you know traveling distances to get to a medical institution. And so our gas card program is really the, the number one way that we get out to those communities. Okay, I will, um, and, yeah. I can add something ahead. to that. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that um, Levine Cancer Institute has done is we have something we call our lung bus. And uh, we are trying to really um, bring awareness to the lung cancer screening. And we know that um, for people that live in rural communities or maybe do not have uh, access to um, insurance, we have a mobile CT screening um, unit. And so you may have seen like a, a mammogram bus. Um, we actually have a bus that has a CT scanner in it. And we um, take that around. Uh, to rural communities. For some that are more Hispanic based, we have a Spanish speaking navigator um, to assist in making sure that people are you know, comfortable and can communicate. We provide smoking cessation with that. And those are scheduled in different uh, rural communities so that people know when we are coming and can set up those appointments. And if somebody does have an abnormal CT scan, then we review that, uh, make sure that we're in touch with them and continue to pursue whatever next step may be, whether it's biopsy or a different type of scan or seeing a lung doctor. Um, so those are other ways that we are trying to get out um, in a very um, purposeful pattern in, into rural communities. Great, thank you both. Um, I think the next question up we have um, for Jenny. Um, they're asking you to please share some of the additional partners you work with. We work with a lot of partners. So we work with over 50 cancer treatment centers. So including the big cancer centers and all the other locations across the state. We work with um, different organizations like Wind River, who hosts our um, lung cancer survivor retreat. We work with, um, oh yeah, and so also we are a part of Lung Can, which is a national coalition of lung cancer organizations. Um, and we are a member there and it's, you know, all the national lung cancer organizations and there's even smaller ones, smaller than us all a part of it and we all come together for things like lung cancer awareness month which is nice and share materials and share messaging um yeah i'm trying to think of other ways we we partner in a lot of different ways with people we work a lot with pharma groups in partnering and other ways even just than sponsoring but you know in events and different uh, different ways um yeah some have a good stuff to help them to have a vehicle too yeah. yeah and we really do um we really do we have a lung cancer summit every year and we try to educate and train people to be an advocate you know in whatever way they want to like how tom is a lay navigator at unc we want to help people become advocates like that so 
we love partnering. We love, you know, sharing resources and being able to point people to different organizations that can help in whatever they want to do. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, this next question is for Dr. Milam. Should doctors automatically inform their patients, if smokers, of annual CT scans? Um, so I think that a, a physician needs to be aware of the criteria. And I think just like we do colonoscopies, um, mammograms, I think CT screening needs to be a part of that. The way that it is set up is that, you know, they do, from an insurance perspective, do need to meet that criteria. And then what's different than a mammogram or a colonoscopy is that the lung cancer screening requires what they call a shared decision-making appointment. It does not need to be a separate appointment. There are many, you know, ways that we are um, trying to make this easier, whether it's, you know, watching a video um, that allows you to get the patient to gain more uh, insight into what uh, CT screening will involve. The reason why the lung cancer screening um, was attached to the shared de decision-making paperwork is that they wanted to recognize that you could detect potentially a false positive, meaning that you could have an abnormal CT scan of the chest that may not be lung cancer, but may be some sort of benign nodule or scar or abnormality that would still require workup or evaluation um, or long-term follow-up. And they just want to make sure that people are aware of that um, going into it. So it's unique that to have a screening that would be tagged to some additional burden within the office. And I think one of the limitations in implementing CT screening is that, you know, a lot of times physicians you know, people in the clinic, physicians may not have the time or the knowledge to uh, complete that portion. I do think it's important. We do know that there's um, a tremendous impact in survival by, um, by utilizing the CT screening. We're also trying to look at, can we do this in younger people, um, you know, that still meet the tobacco history? The CT screening is not for people who are non-smokers, so it's still really looking at a higher risk group of people rather than a blanket on all, um, all citizens. So it's probably missing some of the, you know, people that are non-smokers that are diagnosed with lung cancer. And, and we'll, we'll get there, but this is where it's starting. Great. Our next question, how does vaping fit into the statistics with smoking issues? Great question. Um, vaping's a challenge. Um, you know, most of y'all have probably seen um, some of the more recent information on this, just staggering numbers of people that have been hospitalized or, or even died um, due to um, vaping. They feel like they've connected this with, um, you know, more of the THC vaping. They feel like they've connected it even further with a component within the THC that makes uh, the lungs sticky, and so uh, people have had difficulty breathing, and many people have died with it. It's a huge health issue right now. Um, the American, um, I think there, uh, there was recently, just in this past week, another publication that was reported that shows that vaping is actually causing uh, a more significant difficulty in cardiovascular health, so in the heart, um, and we're just starting, I think, to uncover just how dangerous vaping, um, you know, is going to be. I don't think we really have, you know, information at this time to know the impact vaping will have on lung cancer specifically. Um, lung, all cancers take time to evolve and then be detected. And that can be on the order of, you know, decade um, or more. And so, you know, I, don't, I think we're a little too early to, to know the impact. Vaping is, is not safe. OK, 
Okay. Um, what is the recommended age to start lung cancer screening, and is it recommended for those who do not smoke? Uh, recommended start age is 55 or older. Um, you have to smoke. Uh, be an active smoker or have been an active smoker within the past 15 years, and you uh, need to have smoked um, a 30-pack year history, and that's however many packs you have per day times um, how many years. So if I if I were to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day and I've been smoking for 30 years, then I meet criteria. If I've been smoking half a pack a day for 30 years, I do not meet criteria because I would have a 15 pack year history and you need a 30 pack year history. Okay. Have there been any changes in age distri distribution of lung cancer patients? It seems like you're hearing more about young patients, especially women. Yeah, we do know that there is um, a unique group of young female Never smokers or prior smokers uh, diagnosed with lung cancer, those numbers are um, more abundant than they used to be. Um, we also have a lot of people that are living a long time. And so we still have not, um, you know, we still see a lot of people that are octogenarians that are getting diagnosed with lung cancer because people are living longer and healthier. Um, but there is a there is a distribution in that um, we are making progress in in lung cancer, so you know we're um, we're not seeing as much increase, and also there's more awareness about the issues with tobacco, and for a while there we were still seeing an uptick in females uh, that were smokers because women were still smoking and and men were starting to quit. So all that's an evolution. Um, but yes, there is a there is a group of female non-smokers, never smokers that have lung cancer. And they tend to be younger. Um, this next question, uh, I have an older family member who had a bad cold early last year and a spot was detected on her lung when she went to urgent care. She was a smoker and her primary doctor was never informed. A few months ago, she was diagnosed with stage three cancer. Is this a common scenario? Uh, we don't want to. We don't want that to be a common scenario. Um, you know, it's. Um, I think that I'm sure that that's that happens, and I think that you know it's the diligence of um, whether it's an urgent care or an ER. Um, that, you know, maybe does an x-ray for reasons not related to a cold. Let's say, for example, somebody has an automobile accident and to make sure they don't have any rib fractures, they maybe have a chest x-ray. If there is an abnormality, you know, that does need to be followed up on. And um, even though it may not be the reason why the person even went to get that assessment, How would you go about getting the mobile screening bus to a rural area? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think if, oh, I've got a, uh, so we've got a contact um, who does our, you know, a lot of our mobile screening um, organization and um, scheduling, I guess. I wonder if you would reach out to her um, or maybe if that person wanted to leave their information, if they were interested in trying to arrange something for that region um, or area, maybe we could communicate or I could get that person in touch with a, um, our unit facilitators. Okay, and your information was included in your slides, correct? Is your email in there? It is not. Okay. Okay. Um, well, we can get that information out to everyone that participated um, in the webinar today as well. And if, if there's any um, other contacts for the mobile screening, we can do that. You can send that to me. No problem. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, we have one more question. Um, do you have any recommendations for screening firefighters? 
So we have, um, it, it, I think that's a great question. Um, and right now there is not a separate mechanism for low dose CT to be covered by insurance for that group of uh, people who um, have certainly um, lung exposure and chronic lung exposure to smoke and inhalation. Uh, at Atrium Health, and I'm trying to figure out the reference for that, but Melissa Wheeler, who does a lot of our stuff, has a program specifically established with our firefighting community. And I don't know what other resources are within that program, but it is a focus of our um, of Atrium Health and Levine Cancer Institute and our outreach. I just don't know if it entails lung cancer screening or if, you know, certainly one of the things that we're trying to do is continue to expand uh, the group of people that are getting, you know, lung cancer screening and whether that would be in a, in a trial purpose or a grant purpose. Um, I, I don't have that right now. There is not a recommendation, um, although it's a it's certainly a population of people that are probably at more risk. But I, I wonder if our I don't know what our our outreach program is for firefighters. I know we've got one established. I just don't know the depth of it. And Melissa Wheeler, uh, I think, is the one that manages that. Okay, great. This is Karen. I just wanted to let folks know that I did put Dr. Milam's um, email in the chat box if you would want to cap, you know, copy that down for yourselves. Great. Thank you, Karen. Um, I think uh, that is all the questions that we had. And in the interest of time, I think it is time to close the webinar. Um, thank you very much to all of our panelists. Uh, it was great to hear from all of you. Uh, once again, we are so excited to be your partners here uh, at the Division of Public Health. And thank you for everyone that participated and asked questions.